Hi everybody, uh, welcome. Today we will speak about uh, this uh, afternoon about the climate change. Perhaps you can uh, remember what's the objective of this uh, yes. coming back. So welcome everyone to the European Public Sphere. Uh, as we've probably told you already, we travel through Europe with this dome and we try to engage as many people as possible in discussions about Europe. And all this, we, all this input we gather and we in the end put this in a future archive and give this to the European Parliament after the summer break. So everything you will be saying, well not everything, but the interesting things that we will hear here will indeed end up at the European Parliament as well. So an important thing first, uh, we are filming the discussions. If you are not okay with being filmed or being on the camera, please let us know. It's possible to not put you on the on the film, of course. Yeah, that's fine. So then uh, Anna knows that then she will not put you on there. One important thing, please talk into the microphone. They're not making your voice any louder. I think you can hear that as well. But it makes sure that, uh, that Anna can hear us properly and that the videos also can hear us properly. So, yeah, for this Dome Talk, we're going to talk about climate change. And actually, the first question I would like to ask and make a little round so everyone can give some input is, yeah, what do we uh, understand with climate change and what is the real problem what we're talking about when we talk about climate change? So, can I give you... Okay, let's start. Um, yes, to try to give a definition to uh, climate change, uh, I think it's important to underline the, the global um, uh, scope of the phenomenon. Um, and today, in the today's debates, we, uh, um, we, we talk about climate change uh, when, uh, with a, a global perspective and something, a challenge that should be uh, addressed in a transnational way, which is one of the reasons why it's uh, nowadays very important, uh, all, uh, thanks to the, uh, to the European uh, Union action. And um, so the, the other question was uh, why... What's the real problem we're talking about? Yes, the real po problem is that uh, climate change is mainly, it's also a natural phenomenon, but it's mainly due to um, the man's actions and uh, the, um, the misrespect, I don't know if it's uh, an English word, uh, the lack of respect um, that um, uh, humans are uh, using towards the planet. So I think this is the... Um, to, to try to, to give a definition of climate change and the main challenges. Thank you. What's your meaning? Um, so, to maybe address the second question first, what the real problem of climate change is, is um, as the lady said, is that um, yeah, climate change is a natural phenomenon. It's happening all over the world continuously. Like it's the the code of the universe. Like everything is changing all the time. The problem with with uh, that, that we're experiencing today is that climate change is happening too fast, and that the existing ecosystems don't have the time to adapt to the change that is occurring due to the massive input of um, yeah human activity, and so. The, related to the problem of climate change, what, what truly causes it is that we don't understand the environment. We, yeah, we, we think we do somehow. We, we, we're also brought up with the idea that um, yeah, we're the this, this superior species who's at the top of the food chain and who's, who's able to control nature and predict nature to the highest or lowest degree. Um, but that's uh, that's actually a vision I disagree with, and uh, it all shows itself in how we engage with the environment, with nature. Is that, yeah, it's um, it's very arrogant at the same time to think that we understand her, and um, that uh, nature, yeah, somehow is this this ungraspable phenomena which uh, we, we are very far from understanding, and. Um, yeah, so it shows that shows itself in the actions we, uh, the atrocities we commit. So. Mm. Yeah, like climate change is uh, caused by human activity, and it changes the ecosystem, and it also threatens humanity by altering the the, the food change, by altering the. The, the that the ice melts it's also an existential threat to islands and it's uh, uh, the streams in the oceans change and it's also 
really bad both for the environment and for humanity. Uh, we answer us for you for the moment, yeah. <laughs> Reality. <laughs> so I think that climate change is probably like a really natural phenomenon, that the climate on Earth has been changing since the Earth exists, probably. So I think what we are like experiencing now is probably a really, really natural phenomenon. Uh, like event and occurrence and yeah it might prob it might potentially probably lead to the end of the human species uh, on earth and stuff and it probably was like further like this rise on this this way that climate change is occurring it m maybe it became a little more extreme through uh, human activity but when i would be speaking about climate change i would really see it like as a natural phenomenon and not really not super hardly linked to like activity, uh, human activity on Earth and the uh, transformations on nature that are happening. Do you think that humans can change something still about climate change? There is the possibility, probably, mm -hmm. but no certainty. <laughs> okay. Okay. So then, my first question is: Do you guys think that we need to take action against climate change? And if so, then who actually needs to take action? Who? With who lies the responsibility in the end? Um, 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 so I think, of course, we have to take actions, uh, even if we do not have the certain certainties. Uh, because, of course, when dealing with uh, climate change, we cannot not refer to the um, uh, scientific uh, uh, sphere, so uh, the academics that deal with uh, climate change. And although we in in science we cannot have we cannot reach 100% certain certainties uh, um, that we are going to solve the climate change because we already mentioned that it's a natural phenomenon too uh, but we absolutely I'm my opinion is that we absolutely need to do um, to do something and um, if we uh, ask ourselves uh, who uh, can uh, really take actions I think that uh, um, we um, we need um, from one side um, a top-down uh, action a top-down uh, uh, solutions in the sense that of course uh, government have a lot of responsibilities in do we saw it with the Paris agreement but um, at the same time uh, we can um, we can do something for climate change even in our small um, at the small level at the local level at the personal uh, level so with these two um, uh, side solution um, I also believe that the problem is related that we think that politics is something which um, is separate from like it only uh, occurs at the in the public sphere and not the private sphere and we somehow make a dis distinction between the public and the private and I think it's a very um, it's first of all an ideological separation we make uh, it's uh, it's an artificial category to like two categories we make which are actually deeply interconnected and um, so I, I agree with you that um, like the action has to be uh, top down as it has to be bottom up but the problem is that a lot of people they don't yeah they, they believe that politics is something beyond them and that yeah they're they will most often say that they're not interested in politics because it's so abstract and vague but actually like politics is your life like if you forget to engage politically you're you stop being a human i believe you you, you become this product of society who is steered and guided by forces beyond their control and I think it's one of the most um, noble um, calls a human can have is to engage politically within its group, within its society, because politics is actually nothing more but the organization of a group. And if you consider yourself an object, then yeah, then then don't partake in in, in politics. But if you see yourself as a as a human individual with with rights and and dreams and and a future to to fight for, yeah, it's your it's your obligation to to engage politically. Um, and then whether um, so the responsibility. Uh, lies with everybody. Uh, every structure has has their own type of 
duty to do to fulfill uh, but it, it starts with the small things it's uh, like for example n not wanting to brag but like when I see garbage on the floor when I'm walking like on the street I pick it up even though it's not mine and I put it in the trash can like it's just this it's the small things which count and uh, whether we can change anything about climate change definitely I believe we can um, I have like this weird idea that we can uh, terraform the earth by for example transforming the biggest desert the Sahara Desert into a tropical continent again like it used to be 13,000 years ago Africa was this was a center of, of the planet um, in the sense that it was this big tropical like everywhere there were tropical forests and all that but it all changed because of this catastrophe which happened 13,000 years ago which made the currents of the ocean stop and go counterclockwise and because of that the yeah the the whole current system like um, robbed Africa from its uh, fresh source of water and all that and that's why the Sahara Desert is the Sahara Desert today somehow like that's roughly like quick quickly said but um, like in the 60s there was a, a project from um, I'm not sure if it's um, it was if it was it was in Egypt, but it, there's like this little lagoon at the um, at the Mediterranean, which is about 30, 40 kilometers removed from the Mediterranean, and there was this plan to dug a canal uh, so that the Mediterranean would seep into it and like I don't know create a new tropical. Um, how do you call those uh, oasis? Like, but uh, mm -hmm. connected to the sea, but uh, due to a lot of, I think the Cold War and stuff like that, uh, they, they cancelled it, but there was like plans to actually pave the way like with, with, with uh, true work or there was also this plan of like using nuclear bombs to yeah, uh, make that road, but like it's, it's stupid of course to do it that way. But the uh, point being is that we can literally transform the Sahara Desert and that, that's an example of uh, how we can fight climate change. Uh, we can transform the Sahara Desert into uh, a system which generates and, and uh, works in function and together with water and thus like, I don't know, like we have to look for a positive feedback loop where the, the environment starts to like uh, build up new ecosystems and it's, it's like there are countless of examples which prove it to be possible that we can change or, or, or fight climate change and, and give this positive feedback loop. Um, so it's all about organization, dedication and, and everybody doing politics. Nice. Thank you. Yeah, I can really relate to the comment about private sphere and public sphere because I think we tend to forget that uh, climate change is a political issue. It's not about your personal lifestyle, if you go by bike enough or if, you, if you're vegetarian. Of course, that's also important, but all your choices are influenced by the economy which you live in, which tends to favor things that are connected to fossil fuel and that's artificial and through political action we can change that. I think... Um, could you repeat the question again to make sure that I'm not answering stuff that I'm not supposed to answer? <laughs> yeah, so the idea is um, if you guys think that we actually need to change something for climate change, then who do we look at? Who Who is responsible in the end? Well, I think in the way, like... Of course, take a seat. <laughs> Very shortly for the video, uh, it's important that you talk into the microphone so that we can hear it. And we film this, is that okay with you to be on the camera? Nice. Welcome. Okay. So, I think... Um, I'm not sure like, if you can fight climate change in any way because it's in a way it's a natural phenomenon and I think like fighting climate change I would make this comparison is like trying to fight your aging or something that you're you will you think everything on earth will always transform and everything is like constantly going to change um, f forever until maybe stops and then nothing exists anymore or whatever <laughs> but um, I still think you can like try to like in a way get along with it or try to like look for solutions to have climate change and still 
have humans living on earth as well um but i would and i think this responsibility for it is like up to everybody on earth um but i would say that the distinction is though that like climate change is something that is like really easily facilitated within uh the political structures and the economic structures and the societal structures that are existing right now and i think if we seriously want to tackle climate change in any way we really need to think outside the box and try to come up with new solutions because the way it used to be it doesn't really work that well <laughs> as i think you can see in like many uh, instances in the world and yeah and what I think it all needs in the end is really just political courage. It just needs like initiative and then... So, so you think in the end that the responsibility lies with politics in the end then? No, it lies with the society. Mm -hmm. But it lies with the society to come up with, the new, with like new ideas of like trying to solve problems. If that makes sense. Yes, it does. Yeah. <laughs> nice. So we were talking about climate change and the first question was actually what is climate change? And then we went on to if we need to do something about climate change, then who is responsible for change? Uh, would you like to give some input? Sure. Um, yeah. Hi. Do I need to wait, just, just answer the question? Yeah. yeah okay. So the, um, the climate change. Well, that's kind of easy. The, the climate is changing. You can prove it mathematically with data. So yeah, if you can, then it changed. It, the, it doesn't say anything about the source of the climate change. It's that the weather is consistently changing. That's it. That's climate change. And should we do about some, something about it? Well, if the weather is changing everywhere and it affects the agriculture and the sea level and the weather and the livability, like the, the support that the land and the sea and the area can provide for life, yeah, we should have to do something about it because you either move out of the area or you move into a good area. For example, in Russia, they are very much looking forward to it because all the frozen lands are going to get unfrozen. And the Arctic Ocean, for the first time, is possible for trade. So that's going to change a lot. The Russia dreamed about a uh, warm seaport forever. And they went to tons of wars over that. So now the sea is coming to them. <laughs> um, that's a good part. And the bad part, well... Like 80% of poor areas of the world are gonna get royally screwed because the weather is getting so much worse and uh, it's also coupled with everybody uh, with increasing population. So it's lots of bad trends coming up together for in wrong places. So they will have to do something about it and it's not like rich countries are gonna gang, uh, gang together and uh, help them to overcome this. It's like never happens like that unless they create problems for rich countries like Middle East does now for Europe and everyone just suddenly starts talking about problems in the Middle East, let's help them so they don't have to come here. So I guess it's in some sense naturally rebalancing system what we have to do. Well, the people are reacting to stimulus so they also create stimulus to each other so the poor people creating problems for rich people will make rich people do something either bad or good so we'll have to do something about it one way or another. Do you think we have to do it or politicals? Ah, or the, we or the as citizens? Oh, well. <laughs> you know, I'm from Russia, so we don't believe in our ability as people to change something unless you are prepared to go out into the streets with weapons and ready to die. And if you're not ready to do that, then it's not like you are changing something. And if you're not changing something, then you're inevitably giving it up to politicians. So you can say, let's hope the politicians do something, and we can make a lot of noise. But unless we act at least like Gilles Jones and create a ton of trouble, they're not going to pay attention. They're going to be like, oh, nice, C civil uh, citizens are doing what they're supposed to do. Unless you do something that you're not supposed to, no one is really paying attention. And if you're fighting for climate, well, it's not like you have an ideology you're protecting. You're not protecting the poor, the workers, or your people. It's something abstract. It's not in your mind. It's not, you know, it's not something you can just create an ideology around. Unless you, someone manages to do it, then it's going to be interesting. 
So as we're sitting in the Europe Dome right now, I was thinking um, maybe we can connect this somehow to transnational organizations. Do you guys think that transnational organizations like the EU have a role in this, or is it really more a thing of like us as individuals, as citizens? Okay. I think again the answer is both that uh, the European Union has uh, responsibilities and is actually doing something for to fight in order to fight climate change and better is um, maybe it's a, a, we could say a better environment to start this kind of uh, movements um, and at the same time it is important that also um, uh, these transnational movements can uh, create opportunities to share and to involve uh, citizens in the fight for climate change and for example as I was saying to you before that I'm starting my internship in within this uh, ICIT foundation um, uh, we are uh, participating in this project which is called uh, Trans Europa Caravans and uh, there are five uh, routes uh, all over uh, Europe and in particular uh, the Baltic areas, uh, the, the the route that the, the foundation is dealing uh, with, um, will deal with sustainability and climate change. So maybe uh, these kind of actions can uh, involve local people uh, to uh, raise awareness um, in 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 climate change. So I think again, uh, this, the solution to to the problems has um, have to come from both sides, so from uh, the the institutions and from uh, the citizens. Okay, before we move on, let's welcome our new guest. Um, we're talking about climate change and the first question was mainly what is climate change, what is the real problem and um, yeah, who is responsible for uh, what we want to do about it in the end. So if you want to give some input, I'll give you the microphone. No? Ah, okay. Okay, let me first finish our round about the EU. Um, I also wanted to come back on what you said before concerning ideology, mm. that it's not possible to um, form an ideology around climate change. And I actually disagree because there's at least four examples that are already coming to my mind of how ideology does integrate climate change somehow, or at least the, uh, the ideal of, of, of living more harmoniously with, with, with nature and like it's Stoicism, Buddhism, Confucianism, Taoism, like they, they do somehow speak to nature. It's an ideology which integrates nature into the organization of the people. And that's in the end how like the ideology, at least how I have interpreted it in, in, in my experiences that ideology is the is, the, is, is more or less the, the tale, the myth we, 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 we tell ourselves around the organization of a group. It's like, um, and so like, yeah, at first thought it, it makes to me sense that we can create an ideology which does integrate climate change and does make it possible for us to really do something. And then um, concerning the, the, the participation of, because I didn't get the question entirely, like uh, it's, it's Europe which wants to integrate. Oh, what can Europe do? Uh, well, it's it's. Uh, when I speak to my friends from other continents, what they say about Europe is that Europe is this um, inspiration for the ideal of uh, collaboration, for the ideal of um, confederations. As in, despite our cultural differences, despite our uh, history of warfare, we can transcend that, um, although we needed two world wars for that. Um, yeah, I, I won't argue that we needed that, but yeah, it's like uh, there was no other way than doing it then. Um, even though there's a third world war maybe lurking behind the corner, who knows? There's a lot of discussion about this as well. But uh, yeah, Europe definitely serves as a, um, as an inspiration for for other nations and uh, what Europe is the proof that we can transcend our differences and that nationalism is, is also just a tale we tell ourselves and that's where it all begins is, is the, the the tales we tell our children uh, how we, we we educate them and like I can 
pinpoint certain things that certain people said in my life which made me think from a different perspective and this is the project of Europe like that's what Europe has been trying to do since since 70 years now I believe uh, of course it's far from perfect but yeah it's it's that's what life is about it's never perfect and it's in that imperfection that you try to yeah be the best version of, of, of yourself and of society every day and so yeah we yeah, Europe has a great responsibility, but just as anybody else. Um, yeah, okay, so since climate change is a global phenomenon, you need a global answer. At least you should try to have a global answer. So you need, I think, you must have transnationalism because you cannot tackle it on the national states level. Mm. Yeah, I I, th I guess that's what only what I can say about this. I think that I probably wouldn't say you, nece you necessarily need like transnational or like multinational organizations or something like this. You really just need, in a way, like direct political action and those things. And I think they can, it can prove useful under certain instances, maybe to give responsibility to other um, groups, organizations, or whatever. I think, but. Like speaking, I think you kind of mentioned something like the role that the European Union should play in this. And I would, at least for myself personally, I would say that it's kind of like up to the European Union itself because they have all their treaties and they're trying to, they have all their rules and guidelines. And if they are trying, if they take themselves seriously as like representatives of the European people, whatever that means in the end, then they probably would deal with that and they would feel forced to. But in the end they're just a bunch of people sitting there and they're doing whatever they want and they're not really accountable to anybody so I'm not sure if they can be the solution to climate change but no. yeah um, just to the point that you made about uh, ideology I think it's a bit more than ideology at this point because we can't continue the standards of living at all because right now we're living in a society where we keep producing more and more stuff with large, like, if you think about what's oil based, it's like pharmacy, it's plastics, it's, it's fuel, like all these things. And we keep producing these things and to replace the same things that we then toss out after there's a nick in them. We will have to do things with less and same for the production of meat. This. Like I'm not suggesting everyone become vegans because that is a very large societal change, but you know we should we should know to appreciate what we have here and be able to do with less because just an ideological change is like just the change in the stories that we tell ourselves, tell our children is not going to be enough, um, and it's it, we should also I think stop pretending that it's going to be easy or that we can keep developing um, and, and advancing as a society. No, this will be fucking harsh. Like, this this is going to suck. If we, if we, like, if we get through it, we'll get through it by tightening the belt so, so much. And if we don't get through it, well, then, yeah, then the tight won't be, uh, the, the belt won't be tightened. We'll just fucking lose millions of people to migration to um, terrible weather events and that's the thing we won't even notice it we'll, we'll be sitting here pretty while the rest of the world dies around us we saw this in Mozambique already like there were there was a terrible weather event and it's 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 been it's been characterized as one of the first events that um, is, is like one of the first weather events that's absolutely just attributed to climate change and so many people died and it's hardly in the news and that's terrifying because we we don't really see that here and and there's there's the capital here to protect ourselves and insulate ourselves from that and and we keep producing so 
I, I think that it's way more than ideology, and I think it's it's it, it is gonna suck. But we have to, because well, otherwise other people will die, and that's our responsibility that we need to take, and not just that of European representatives. It's gonna be hard for everyone, and not just for the people discussing at the top. Well, it's yeah. Um, yeah, <laughs> I'll quickly join in no, because you you made me think of something when when you were talking about production because there are already so many alternatives like alternative ways of producing. I remember that story like um, that already in the 60s or 50s, for example, we knew how to make these nylon tights in a way that they just wouldn't rip. But then, because then if you only need one pair, nobody buys any more nylon tights. Yeah. So they started producing them in a different way. And that is something that, that really needs to change. So maybe there could even be a positive incentive system or something to really like incentivize a different way of production if we have to produce or another platform with these solutions like there's even uh, what do you call it in, in 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 english like you put your like food trash and all of this in a yeah not really recycling when you you want to make it <laughs> become earth again like compost. yeah compost oh, okay it's actually the same as in german <laughs> and there are these systems that you can even have in your kitchen you know like the the little bins with the um, with some worms in it and then there are things that we can already do but i feel like they're not very well known or at least most people don't really know about them so there should also be a way of promoting these solutions that we already have because there are so many ideas out there yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I'll go back to filming. <laughs> but I think the problem is there that that just isn't really in line with how the world works because the most like the the, the, the biggest incentive that I think is now dominant in the so called Western world is that there's only one direction and it only goes forward. Like it's only getting better, it's only getting cheaper, it's only getting nicer, the quality is getting better. And this is I think that's really like heavily indoctrinated into like all into like every single person's mind. And I think this also like kind of looks way more dramatic when you look at it it's on like on like more global things like the you, you brought the the you brought the tides and I think it's the same with light bulbs, smartphones, like all this stuff. It's just not attractive eco uh, econ uh, economically. You just, there's no incentive to change those things because then the people who would be making money now, they would stop making money. And that's why I think it's really necessary to think outside the box. Like it's not, we can't just sit here and like try to come up with solution uh, to face climate change. No, I think if we want to tackle climate change, then institutions like university, like ideas of nation states, uh, like basically the whole world and how it's built that needs to go away and we need to come up with new solutions. Yeah. I'd like to intervene if you don't mind. Yeah, like me oh, too, sure, just a ahead. little bit. So I wanted to say, uh, uh, relate to you about ideology. It's just, uh, I really think that the consumption in in the Western world mostly is very ideological. It's something that you made your. It's ideological that we believe that consumption makes us happy, and and that it's also you can really see it in their identity that some people develop an identity based on what they consume so i just wanted to say that yes you want to yeah uh, sure uh, so hello welcome <laughs> <Hi>. <laughs> do you maybe first want to give some input we're talking about climate change and uh, what's the real problem with climate change Take responsibility. Any thoughts you have? Uh, well, well, out of out of the blue, <laughs> um, I do think that climate change is really challenging us as a society and our abilities to make responses to a problem that encompasses broader 
broader people than just the people that belong to a nation. And I think it one of, it's one of the key issues that we have to give an answer to in the la, in the in the next five to ten ten years. Uh, and we apparently don't have the tools to do it right away. Ah, yeah. So uh, you you missed some parts. Like we were talking about consumption a lot for the last circle, and uh, I think it's uh, the consumption issue is. Uh, from one side, it's easy to say a solution, just uh, charge the real price of items, not just like the item is not completely paid off until it's recycled or com properly like mm, properly uh, got rid of, like the light bulb or uh, ni nylon ties or uh, whatever, like the sneakers. They are not done, their function is not complete until you have recycled them and that should be included in the price and that price should be charged in the price of the item and that would appropriately change the price and uh, the supply and demand of the item in the market so you will not buy plastic straws if they cost you a euro or you will not uh, use an uh, bin, uh, uh, um, had a gas car yeah if the fuel if if, if benzene costs like uh, five euros a liter or something but then uh, you'll have gilets jaunes <laughs> that's exactly what happened in france they tried to implement these policies and uh, people didn't like it <laughs> because it costs it costs a lot so uh, either everybody does it and everyone suffers or no one does it and uh, some people suffer it's either me and others shared burden or concentrated in areas that have the highest impact which is interesting actually if you look at the climate just in general and the geography and where, which countries are actually developed it's consistently the podcast and there is an interesting observation the people are the most productive uh, when the average temperature is about 12 degrees Celsius so it makes sense if you need cold to be productive because well if you grow up like if it's a medieval country and if it gets super cold and you have to plan for winter and you have to develop skills for planning and you have good governments because if you don't then you'll freeze to death and stuff like that you know <laughs> uh, uh, well if everything gets warmer then we all get a little bit more crazy yeah no one likes heat um, other than that, well, if you cannot just include it in the price of everything, then uh, if like we can assume that we are not conscious and we are just slightly smart animals and we just act like unconscious systems. So let's assume everything goes as it goes. Climate gets warmer, the poor parts of the world gets even more screwed, um, more refugees, more nationalism response, more tighter borders as a response to floods of refugees. Uh, that's also increased tensions because if people are nationalists and they are looking for enemies outside, because that's a natural response, uh, we continue consuming. I'm just trying to you know, play the mind. So we continue consuming like crazy. Uh, what, what's the result? Like more climate change, more, 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 ta more tensions, more, more screwing up the poor parts of the world. Then the, the changes uh, arrive to the southern Europe, a little bit northern Europe, southern United States, droughts, fires, uh, a little bit more warm, less productivity because warmer weather means less productivity. You have to spend electricity on AC, you have to spend uh, more uh, on more on healthcare because tropical diseases or diseases driving the warm weather, more parasites, you know, all kinds of causes that come with warmer weather. So in, in that sense, maybe global colding would have been better than global warming. Um, it's not nice, but we'll have to adapt. So what, what the usual conservative in America would say, I, I paid all the nation to their politics, it would be that, well, if, if it's true, we'll just get used to it. Everyone gets, like, some people will get screwed, some people will not, but the system will rebalance itself, we'll survive. Of course we will survive, we're humans. We'll do whatever it takes. But the, it's not the question that everyone is asking. <laughs> It's not about survival, we'll survive and we'll be fine. Everyone just move northern or a little south closer to poles or uh, develop new tech. It's just how many people will get screwed in the process? How many will die? How will our morals change after that? Will we perpetually stay in the belief that others can get screwed and it's not my problem? And the philosophy of the world will develop in that sense. And then three and four generations after now, no one will think about anybody else except for themselves. The, the world can be super technologically developed, but the uh, social fabric can be very bad. That's the things which we are playing and talking about. It's not, it's not the planet. The planet will be fine. It doesn't care if it's warm or cold. It's us, our conscious.
That's what we are worried about. That's at least what I think. Perhaps I have a bad question. I think also, is it not um, a fashion event uh, to speak about climate? And is it not uh, the possibility to develop a new economy? Perhaps it's that also that uh, can be after the climate change. Sure, yeah. But there can be a new economy and you can start producing green stuff. On mass and try to sell them because they are green, but it's still going to be consumption. And well, again, if you want to go truly green, then you put the real price on items. And if you put the real price on items, everyone gets poor and everyone ties their, uh, ties their belts, so to speak, uh, because everything is far, far more expensive. The real price. And if you do that, then a lot of people will be unhappy, especially the poor countries. They'll get screwed the most again. So. I think the best thing we can do is just pack the investment funds, move to Africa and help them skip a lot of development stages as fast as possible. So that they, like, you know, there was an episode of Rick and Morty. I'm not sure if you watched it, but it's a post-apocalyptic world and they don't have much tech left. They're just living like savages, having a lot of fun being savages, but still. And at some point, the, our technological genius, the main hero Rick, gets trapped with them he, because his kids like the place a lot. So what he does is accelerate their technological development and they suddenly end up with a very boring world which they just hate and the kids get bored and they leave. So we can just help the other poor countries get over to that stage as fast as possible because it's a state of mind. It's it's a set of fears for example if you're an immigrant in Europe you don't and you don't have European citizenship the only thing you care number one is how not to get kicked out so you don't care about taxes or you don't care about policy if someone wants to go for you to go to a demonstration you do not because that's not your ma problem your problem is to earn enough to stay at the job to spend five or six years until you get the permanent residence. Same for poor people. Their situation is much less stable. They do not have the ability to afford to think about these things. So you need to move them from position when they cannot afford to, to think about this to position when they can, like with China. They suddenly start thinking about the clean, uh, clean air. The, the where air in the capital moved from post-apocalyptic nightmare from pictures in 19th century London to where the sky is black and darkened and you cannot see 150 meters from yourself to fairly okay when you don't have to have red alarms on television when you don't breathe freely on the outside so it's, you know it's either you I think that's the only realistic solution like humane solution the inhumane solution is to just shut down the borders and have fortress Europe and sit, sit this out you know, it's also a solution. I don't know. Like, just don't close the immigration policy until I get the citizenship. Uh, well, I don't really have any legitimation to speak about this topic as a social sciences student. Uh, the closest thing I have to formation on climate change is my father's uh, line of work, which is closely related to this. But I would like to I would like to bring back the conversation instead of going to a post-apocalyptic future or a series of consequences that linked up one each other i would like to be on on the on the society we live on nowadays and i would like to pose two different two different views or two different approaches that i believe that are the ones that we we might experience in the the side guys the how the people approach climate change the first one of all is the more optimistic one the first one of all is the one that i would say that I was surprised when I noticed that in in my country many of the many of the political parties actually agreed on very few things. But one of them usually was the fact that there had there was an answer to be given to climate change. And not only this, but also the fact that there have been several demonstrations and the fact that I do think that there is a general consensus for the the fact that climate change has to be addressed. On this more positive note, I would believe that climate change will. Well, it's just on the society. One of the big obstacles that 
makes it hard for uh, countries and their, their governments to, to be able to implement climate change policies, I would say, and this might only come from the fact that I'm doing research on lobbying right now, but it's the big lobbying enterprises. Big uh, petrol, big uh, industry, like, uh, yeah, heavy industry, heavy chemicals industry and big for, um, agricultural industry are putting a lot of money to have lobbying groups, to have lobbying venues and to even influence directly not only in the national level but also in the European level to influence directly politicians so that climate laws are either not passed or very mildly and very moderately passed. I do believe that if lobbying was more transparent and our parliamentaries could be held accountable for the decisions completely that would be a very big push for environmental laws but this is again the more uh, the more optimistic uh, point of view because as you quickly mentioned in many regards we could say that human beings we are only do what is in our immediate survival and if we look at it from that point of view then I would be surprised if, if we were mostly uh, affected by climate change but again I do believe that there is a big um, there's a big belief, well, it's not belief for climate change, but there is a big conviction that climate change has to be addressed in the elites. So what is it? Are we going to try to tackle this from the democratic point of view of trying to limit lobby groups uh, input into politics? Or are we going to take it from the more uh, authoritarian point of view and trying to implement uh, climate change measures from up above, from up above to bottom? There is another one. So. Yeah. How do you know? Yeah. Uh, huh? Don't. Just a quick point on the on the log lobbying message is that um, like a, a lot of what's been said right now that is that in policy and and also just in in general purchasing is the concept of vote with your dollar. And that's that's definitely something we see in lobbying, as in people people can apparently, uh, certainly in the United States, uh, with Citizens United versus F uh, Federal Election Committee, um, can can just use money and and uh, and resources to uh, to affect policy really easily. But the big problem with that is, well, those who have more money have more voting powers. Then um, also quick back to uh, the redundancies, uh, well, um, built-in redundancies and products uh, that allow, that um, ameliorate this. Um, or for example, products that claim to be better than the original. Well, the main problem there is that they're put on the shelf next to the original products. Like, Coca-Cola didn't come out with Coke Zero and then take Coke off the shelves. No, we now have three options. Like, that's... Well, easily, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> On regard to the lobby groups, there is also, again, inside of the lobbying theory, I would say, there's also two different approaches. There's the more... I think, well, I always frame it the same way, but the more optimistic one and the more pessimistic one. And the optimistic one would be that lobbying is a way to directly have citizen input into politics. Uh, for example, there's, of course, feminist uh, lobbying groups and there is, of course, uh, environmentalist lobby groups and there is of course rifle arms uh, lobby groups which are very big in United States and there is of course anti-environmentalist lobby groups but again there's the more pessimist one and is that the the, um, the companies with more money are going to be able to do more lobbying and thus keep the status quo unchanged and so yeah, it could be interesting to see how lobbying and public interest might work together with subsidiarity but it's kind of strange yeah, just a short one. I guess it's like we have to be better human beings to begin with, to be able to handle problems. Like we cannot, if you imagine that the society is a one human being and the, the government is like a decision-making organ, part of the brain, you know, like not language part, but decision, like decision-making part. Uh, if the decision-making part of the brain is constantly stuck in what's comfortable to itself instead of actually facing the problems, like with lobbying, like you're stuck with comfortable oil and gas instead of actually facing the problem, or you're stuck with comfortable industrialized agriculture using bad pesticides, for example. It's not like, I, I'm a little more 
less problem. I have I don't have that much problem with agriculture. They are feeding everybody, so <laughs> they're nice guys. But uh, like if you like in general, if you are demanded in a in a way that you are incapable of actually seeing the problem for the problem, and you're incapable of actually acting on a problem when you're supposed to be able to act on a problem, then you're probably not that healthy mm -hmm. as as a as a virtual human being, as a society. So, I mean, you you have to work from inside, from the society point of view. You have to work from economics point of view. And if nothing works, then <laughs> hope for the best. So just a small point. Like, I... I, I think what is interesting about climate change that it really challenges this Eurocentric way of thinking about the economy that we are the most developed, thus our way is the best. Like I'm, I'm not an expert of agriculture, but I read a lot of literature about how actually original traditional Indian farming, for example, is much better to the environment and also effective. and. I think uh, in order to tackle climate change, we have to also question this idea that Europe is like in the forefront of history, and it's like, and we need development. And maybe it's it's the other way around. Maybe we should go. We should. Um, prioritize other things than economic growth. Um, I'm going to use a little analogy from paleoanthropology. That means like the history of anthropology, but like long, big scale. Um, when we were still um, Australopithecines, like the Australopithecus, we were the beginning of us was um, our, our our forefathers were expulsed from the the high trees and they started to roam the ground and they were very vulnerable and on the ground you had like these big predators saber tooths um, there was like for example one who, which had like this big tooth right here and um, we have this little hole at the back of our skulls and so you have to imagine this yeah uh, almost 500 kilos or a ton weighing saber tooth comes to this little human monkey and just rips it apart and like destroys it like instantly and there's nothing that that little human monkey could do like it's 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 completely vulnerable to the power and the the the, the might of, of this this monster which was which threatened it and so you have to imagine that um, yeah, basically there's this certain trend within human evolution, whereas they said that we started to become bipedal, as in we started to walk straight up with our, both our feet, our brain started to grow, our hands started to become more specialized. And so there's a lot of reasons why this happened, it's not just one. Um, so they use the example that we started to use stone tools and all that. But um, one of the most important parts is that um, there's something within our brain which started to alter what which was our capacity to uh, reproduce speech language um, and it's through the communication that we started to, those proto humans started to use that there was a sort of collaboration uh, possible because they started to use certain noises to describe what should be done in that specific situation and so i imagine that the first saber tooth ever killed might have been by accident by one of those proto-humans throwing a rock at its head and it died or maybe they started to all throw at the same time rocks and like there was a certain defensive mechanism towards this and the um, point of this analogy is that um, as it was also mentioned earlier is that we need to learn how to think outside of the box and that is through communication only through communication we can transcend these problems and uh, actually the climate change today is a saber tooth of, of two three million years ago it is something like it, it horrifies us and it terrifies us. it haunts us in our dreams and we don't really know what to do about it right now but it's uh, it's important we start 
um, yeah, definitely work together. And as um, our colleagues said earlier, that uh, it's it's definitely going to be rough. Uh, but that's like life. Life is rough. Life is not something given. It's 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 an illusion that it's easy. Uh, if you really want to live your life, you will suffer a lot. But it's you will suffer with meaning, and and that's what yeah brings us together. Is that once we can share that meaning, then we can we can achieve those goals. And that's through I believe personally through technological development, as in trying to find means, just like those monkeys use technology to kill the, the saber tooth, we can um, find the means to, to, to uh, tackle climate change also through technology. And I use the example of terraforming the Sahara Desert maybe. Um, but there's also, for example, and maybe this is uh, me being wrongly informed, but um, like I'm, I'm, I'm deeply inspired by Nikola Tesla. As in, he um, he claimed to have found an ability to reproduce electricity um, uh, based on the geomagnetical force of the Earth, and uh, like he was like uh, mysteriously, like he mysteriously dis like he he died when he was 80 or so. But all his projects, all his work, mysteriously disappeared and was like taken by the CIA and and like nothing of it was published and all that and like there's big questions we can ask in terms of solutions like what kind of solutions can we find if we would just like go into the work of people like Nikola Tesla or just like people who dared thinking outside of the box and there's a lot of us already ready for us the tools are there because somebody said that the tools aren't there yet uh, but the tools are there already I believe it's it's ready for us to be used what we need is the mentality the the and then to come back to my point of the tales we tell our children yes it is about the tales we tell our children because if I tell my child every day that it's worth nothing that it's bad at math that it can maybe be good at English and that it will be a doctor then that child will become a doctor who is good at English sucks at math and and is worth nothing but if I tell the child that they're they're th th this this human creature which collaborates is, is up for communication and should help and always be open to to embrace the other then the child will exactly do that and that's the point is that the tale we tell our children will will deeply influence the the system we're in and like it's not something which will happen immediately it will take time it will take two or three generations before we can finally speak of a harmonious living uh, world but um, like it, it's it's definitely like the, the this this type of communication is what there is where the change truly begins is where we're open for ideas and where we can yeah we're not engaging violently with each other this is what what makes this project possible and this is what makes yeah every every struggle which humanity faces possible we will definitely always be confronted with survival just like the hunger and thirst and the need for air which confronts us on a daily scale we can um, yeah it, it will always exist but again the question is like how can we how can we transcend this need and how can we do it better and like it's it's again like the tools are there but it's just we need a new mentality and like if I would be a politician I would like fight and like it's maybe my dream to one day become one but I would like fight for absolute education for everybody like educate the fuck out of everybody uh, so that they they every opinion uh, is, is like build on arguments and is, is build on, on, on ideas and like there, there's no um, yeah, to also like go into more uh, psychoanalytical terms, like there's no no ego dictating the the the, the function of, uh, functioning of society. There's no centralized ego. There's like a collective voice. Let's say like that. So yeah. I think what you said. <laughs> I think it's really interesting what you said. But I would also disagree a little. <laughs> I think what you said about like Tesla, for example, I don't know too much about uh, this person, but what you were basically saying was that uh, those ideas were like really, really good, but in the end, this person disappeared and probably the CIA was involved in this, but then the problem is the CIA in the end. And I think the solutions are like there in our, like our heads are all really amazing and they, can think a lot of good things and that this way of like us speaking here together of course it's really really useful but the problem is at least in my opinion that they are like those institutions that put themselves above us uh, and then they destroy all this progress we could ever make because then they're being influenced by like lobbyist groups 
by politicians who only care about self-interest, who are caring about like uh, national pride and those things. And I think those are the things uh, we need to we need to tackle, because yes, in the end, everybody can go to the to a university and everybody can know uh, can learn like a lot of really good stuff. And but the problem is is uh, like the challenge is to actually be able to like manifest those ideas in, into the world in order to make a in order to make change. I would just uh, like to add uh, what about what we, uh, you were saying uh, about the importance of the education and to um, make um, starting from uh, children. Um, I made uh, an internship in uh, Denmark uh, a few months ago, and I uh, could really understand the differences, the huge difference that there is in uh, in terms of education and educational program um, between um, Denmark and my country and. And um, it's um, very strange and negative to see how um, uh, there is uh, a difference in the sense of community. To f um, in Denmark, I saw that there is uh, this kind of um, conversation, collaboration between students, and they start to build. Uh, how can I say to build uh, relations uh, as we are human being uh, starting from the elementary schools which is something that for example in Italy which is my country uh, is not so typical we are um, sort of programmed to uh, succeed and to be at the top and uh, in a sort of um, uh, how can I say um, pushing for individualism more than uh, building a community and I think this uh, makes really the, uh, the difference because in fact if, if we uh, take a look at the, uh, the Scandinavian countries they are the leading country, countries in the fight for climate change I don't want to say that in Italy or in Spain and so on there are not people uh, involved in this kind of things but uh, I think that um, education is vital for uh, creating uh, uh, a better world, better communities who wants to communica uh, communicate to so to build alliances and to make change. So, just this. I, uh, I believe that the next um, evolution or revolution or whatever you want to call it that humanity will experience will be the educational revolution whereas like people all over the world through social media are being confronted with uh, with information which otherwise would never be within their grasp and uh, yeah we, of course we have the problem of fake news like how how will we tackle that and uh, that's only possible by by not allowing others to dictate what is news as in um, like if we for example if you take Fox News as an as an example like if they really are going to dictate what news is then we're doing it in a wrong way but like try to have an open source type of uh, flow of information then you can rule out fake news and um, to actually come back on, on what you said earlier I'm not entirely sure because I forgot a little bit because I was working on the idea but um, like a, another little analogy from uh, from history like there was um, after the first world war in Belgium there was like this one week uh, period where there was no government so we're actually speaking of uh, there is no authority dictating what there should be happening so we're actually speaking of anarchy like the absence of authority uh, and a lot of people think that anarchy is doing what you want uh, but that's that's a very wrong view and that's how we're um, induct like yeah brainwashed into into certain ideas we never approach the idea from a more scientific point of view let's call it like that um, it's like uh, yeah it's propaganda it's like always against a current and uh, like I believe that in my um, yeah thinking about politics my experience in it is that there's two trends uh, in, in, in human history you have this more integrative harmonious idea where there's a decentralization of power and the question is what is power in this context and there uh, Aristotle he defines power as the capacity of a human being to transcend his limits and that is only possible through collaboration um, that's Aristotle his definition of power and then you have our modern academies who define power as the capacity to impose your will onto somebody else and that shows the type of government that our human history has known as a centralized government where there is um, 
Yeah, there's always this one will, the pyramidal structure defining and 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 um, yeah, defining everything. And so I believe that there's these two trends. You have the 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 again the more harmonious, like let's do it together, or the I am the one, I will tell you what to do. And it's always these type of voices. And so um, to come back to the analogy with Belgian history is that so there was this one week period where the uh, the Belgian nation had no king. The king was literally in another country because, yeah, the war had just uh, was just over, and so for over a week, the Belgian government had, or the the whatever you want, proto government, or wasn't even existing. They were trying to reintegrate the king and the whole, yeah, um, structure into into the into the, the fresh system because there was four years of chaos four years of warfare and um, so what they did was like create this big symbolical parade which went through uh, the um, yeah one of the the big ways of Brussels and all that and it's a lot of blah 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 but uh, the point being is that it's really interesting what happened in that one week period and what happened actually is that it was as it was an anarchist situation as in there was nobody imposing their uh, will there was no, there was no authority what happened is that the people started to self-organize they they uh, in, uh, introduced this um, rule that after 10 uh, p.m. you're not allowed to go on the streets because it's dark uh, alcohol was banned stuff like that and what this was through uh, communal discussions like these like okay so what are the rules to everybody tell me what what do you want those rules what do you want those rules and we will have a discussion about this and this is actually what what true anarchy means as in there's nobody saying and I'm gonna do this and we will we shall do it like this everybody makes part of this group and um, so why why did the people accept the reintroduction reintroduction of uh, a top-down force control system was because the people weren't educated and this is the big problem is that if you don't have the education to actually express your your voice your your inner magic you will never be able to actually see what is going wrong and like you will confuse a little bit of everything and like maybe there will be this voice inside of yourself saying eh, but you, you don't really know how to express it in words and that's the importance of education and I believe that when people like because these are really special times today because I, I like I see myself as this just normal European citizen who got some well, I went to travel a little bit like the, the, the how do you say the standard European citizen nothing special about me just besides my privilege that, that I'm living in Europe like it's, it is a privilege um, uh, in the sense that yeah I, I don't have to experience what it means to walk every day 12 kilometers to my school and all that like some children in Africa have to do it's really a privilege um, but point being is that me being a normal citizen I had access to social media to for example YouTube I've learned so much through YouTube the internet by just doing my research and like children are, are naturally uh, curious for, for more and, and like find the inner child within you because I believe that the, the biggest crime our governments have actually committed on us is making uh, learning boring like by, by sitting in a classroom and needing to memorize these things and like yeah I remember myself continuously making drawings and trying to play with my pens and all I didn't care like that's not learning learning is, is, is exploring the new like playing and that's what Scandinavia makes so strong is that they they learn through play and by, by teaching children through play they, they become they become geniuses and, and like if we can re summon this this inner child within us like um, yeah and, and letting it play and and, and become truly educated people because for the first time in human history this is happening like this never happened before like people being so educated at this grade that we can we can have this conversation it never happened before okay okay we're already speaking of it maybe since the 50s and 60s but even so like we every day like you're exposed with so much information you just do your research um, on YouTube there's thousands if not millions of channels which like talk about any topic if you can you can learn so much by just doing this on a daily scale and teaching children how to learn and play you can um, yeah you, you, you can you can definitely save climate if I but I think kind of the problem with knowledge is that knowledge is like always biased in a way 
and that I think that this is like the really big danger and I think yes it's really amazing that you can go on like Facebook, YouTube, the whole internet basically and you can find a lot of information but every person or like every group of person that is like creating those informations they're always having an agenda and that this agenda is mostly hidden and you rarely really really know about this agenda and I think this then could potentially create way bigger problems than if people would just not be, e be educated because if people are not educated anymore then this definition of like what educated means for itself uh, changes for itself as well and I I think that this could be a solution as well to just like kind of move away from this like yeah western rational thinking logical arguments uh, the scientific method empirical research and like all those things because they are just following like a very certain uh, purpose in that direction that's why I would personally always be careful when like trying to go for like yes education every the whole world needs to be educated I don't think the world needs to be educated because the world was really stupid for a long time in history and I mean m we are all alive so they must have done something right I guess um, well I, I, I disagree with you on two points is that um, like no I agree with you on the part that, that you say that our knowledge is always biased but I believe the point and this is the distinction. There's a difference between education and indoctrination. And indoctrination always happens through fear and uh, like a, a top-down um, input of information. And education is actually a bottom-up experience where you sit in a circle and you discuss a topic and there's ideas flowing in. And there's not just this one person saying what you need to know. It's like everybody together like bringing forth the the input and that is true education and so there has to it's very important uh, to make this distinction between education and indoctrination what we all experience in our lives i call it indoctrination because r very rarely i can i can pinpoint again some moments where i had true education and that always came from a uh, an, an, an um, interacting group and not just one individual telling me what I should know so yeah that's that's the main difference and um, actually it's uh, also um, uh, an illusion to think that we were stupid in the past as in like uh, actually if, if you if you th think just a moment about the skills and, and knowledge needed to survive in the wild like um, like before the agricultural revolution happened like hunters and gatherers and all that they were stronger more intelligent and like yeah j they were actually like superhumans if you think about it because they were continuously day in day out confronted with survival and they had to adapt to that survival so they were really if, if we, we we are actually today nothing compared to them and since the agricultural revolution you have this loss of uh, that that knowledge because there was no written culture and the oral one was just based on waiting until your potatoes grew harvesting them and then eating them and, and stuff like that so and only and then we have like this this yeah very slow evolution of 11,600 years that's the agri agricultural revolution until today um, but yeah before like I, I disagree with you to, it, it, when you say that we used to be stupid and, and, and now we know stuff. I surely I find this a very interesting discussion but, but I want to try to see if we can get it back a little bit to climate change and democracy. Yeah. You wanted to give yeah, this yeah, input? Yeah. Go for it. <laughs> because I think I think it's a really nice distinction you're making there between education and indoctrination. But like now trying to look at like back into the world what we're seeing like all, all over the place right now is that we're telling people like yes everybody needs to get educated, yes everybody needs to go to school and stuff. But how do those schools look like? you're not being educated there like you're being indoctrinated there and then like how can you ever tr like you know like based on those discussions we we had on like climate change the last hour or what mm, whatever you when you're being indoctrinated you will never be able to come up with any new solutions there and it really needs this in my opinion this like initiative uh, to break out uh, of those enclosed like ed education uh, circles where like one person is talking and the others are supposed to believe it because they have a authority or power or anything like this. 
I want to pose a very different question. You were talking about anarchy before, and how you were talking about it sounded a lot to me like our, the pure form of democracy, in the sense that power is to the people in the end. The people decide what the rules are. So trying to link this back to climate change, do you guys think that there is room for democracy within the climate change debate and within the like the things that we need to change for climate change? Is there room for democracy or is democracy only slowing this progress process down? I, I would say like right away that I think this notion of democracy is really pointless in the 21st century because it means so, 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 so many different things. And I think it's really nice. Yes, the idea sounds really, really nice, but everybody thinks that democracy is something different. You have like a lot of different aspects. You can take thousands of people have defined democracy differently. The EU is democratic. The UK is democratic. Apparently, Turkey is democratic. Russia is democratic. So I'm not sure if I would be able to answer that question in the end. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah, what uh, came to my mind is really connected to what you said, because I think we need to broaden our definition of democracy, and we don't, we shouldn't just think about it as voting every fourth year and so on. It's more. I think if if there's a farmer who does ecological way of doing agriculture and his or her land gets privatized that's also a violation of democracy because it's and it's it's also the the income inequalities are also i see them as a violation of democracy so i think this ecological struggle and the democratic struggle is really related because what is happening to our earth is a, is a violation of democracy because there are like I, I think it's also related to privatization that that uh, so many of our natural resources like uh, Nestle opened the um, uh, factory in Michigan and they get the water for the water resources for free and they're also responsible for a lot of environmental damage the Nestle company and they shouldn't be able to do this um, I think it's um, very important to make the distinction of the type of democracy we're we're speaking of because in um, when, when when we're confronted with something we shouldn't be asking the question of what it is but how it is happening and so a democracy is is, is what the question of what but the, the second question you should ask is how and so democracy today at least in the limited form we've experienced it until today is a representative democracy so it's actually like um, an oxymoron, as in saying the, like, um, wait, uh, like uh, now an example of an, uh, an oxymoron. Uh, an oxymoron is like something, a, a, a word, and you place an adjective in front of it which contradicts it. Okay. So for me, yeah, and for me, a, a representative of democracy is, is an oxymoron because you're like saying that power to the people, democracy, but then a representative one, as in people will be representing the people who are supposedly in power so where is the true power it's with the representatives so it's an oligarchy point and to, to put it in one word representative democracy what we experience today is an oligarchy so is is the true ideal of democracy possible and i i try to link it with anarchy in the sense that um a direct democracy where the people who are in power supposedly are engaging directly within the economic system that that's uh, the, the, the political system I mean that's that's what anarchy is actually embodying and uh, again like a lot of people think that anarchy is, is the is the uh, doing what you want that's not true that's that's far from it that's the that's a state of chaos uh, anarchy is pure organization where you um, yeah organize yourself to the point where there is no room for for corruption where there's no room for um, yeah representation everybody is engaging directly and so I believe that there's 
two ways and has been said before to tackle climate change you can do it from a very authoritarian point of view where one person will be the embodiment of the will of the people if that's even possible i don't i don't think so but like it, it would be yeah very forced let's say like that and will it work mm, i i doubt so because again this education will be lacking and it will be a system of slavery and uh, yeah th there won't be really anything to be proud of let's say like that i wouldn't be proud to be human if, if that's how we tackle it but um if we do it through a, a direct democracy where people because like a representative democracy i doubt we will get there or at least maybe in a trend transition type of way where there is a political party which already tries to embody the will of the people if it is possible but as in like a more humane approach a more harmonious approach let's say like that and not um, yeah not not going through violence and all that using uh, technological innovation to to actually tackle this problem because it's each time technology which helped us transcend our issues um, so yeah I believe that uh, democracy definitely has a has has a pla has a place within um, the the solving of the problem of climate change. But again, it's it's important to know what type of democracy we will be having and and how we will be doing this. Because yeah, just saying yes or no won't suffice. It's just a consideration over um, the idea of um, of uh, anarchy you were talking about. Uh, so, for example, um, uh, usually when I mm, think at anarchy, um, I seem it seems to me that it is uh, quite uh, difficult to put it in practice. Um, and since I mean we live in a society where uh, we are uh, um, represented in a, in this way, uh, do you think that it's less effective when, for example, just make, make an example, the ministries of uh, environment of each uh, member states in the European Union gather here to have discussion on how to tackle uh, the climate change? Do you think it's less effective than having? Uh, uh, a type of anarchy organization, an anarchical organization in society? Or well, um, I don't know, but like recently there have been a lot of videos on, on Facebook which have been appearing on my feed is of how people are cleaning up the beaches of um, the, the Pacific coast and all that. And that's that's already, again, an example of anarchy. Yes. We don't need the government to do that. It's, it, it takes the people to do it. And uh, if you wait for the government to do something, <laughs> maybe you will get there. Maybe. Let's see. But they will only do it out of necessity. And um, there's there's... Yeah, the question is where where do our priorities lay? And uh, again, if you if you think that that yeah you don't partake into politics, that you're an object of society, and you just I don't know scroll your way through life and eat, yeah, do whatever you want, no, then then anarchy won't work. But if you do your duty, if you assume your duties, what is your duty? Yeah, I have like this whole. <laughs> idea of it like an ideology which I like puzzles which puzzle pieces put, put together and for me it makes so much sense it's it's the most natural thing to do for a human being is to is to actually engage politically and 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 this is its its foundation for the anarchist state in which it would be living um, it takes a lot of work it's really super hard to get there but yeah like uh, People can definitely solve their, their, their issues if they really want it and if they put their priorities straight. And um, so, yeah, you have like the example of the beach cleanup, or uh, otherwise, for example, the other day I was walking uh, in Leeuwarde in, in northern Holland, and uh, I come in the street and I see like this sign and it says a WhatsApp group. And I'm like, why do you need a WhatsApp group? And then it came to me, of course. You need a WhatsApp group if you want to stop like policing and all that. As in, you need to police because there's thieves, which are uh, like assaulting homes. But if you have like a, a network which actually works together to uh, um, fight the thievery, you don't need police anymore. You you can just do it yourself. And that's another example of how anarchy is possible. Um, but of course, you will have how to say it, um, uh, organization in more specialized ways like uh, but it's it's yeah that's open for debate how you will do it and, and yeah I, 
I think like if I would be speaking about anarchy, then this always for for me it would also always imply that like everybody has the right to do anything they want, and there's like nothing that holds them back. And this is I think one point. But then like since we're in the end still trying to talk about climate change a little bit. <laughs> I think about like those actions of beach uh, cleanups and things. Yes, I think it's really nice you clean up the beach, but I think it's kind of like an illusion to be like, yes, I'm cleaning up the beach, so you're countering climate change or anything like this, because the plastic is still there. Like, if you want to do something against climate change, then maybe one could think like destroy the factories that produce uh, climate, uh, produce plastic, or that like cause uh, those harm to the environment, because those are the problems that like. <coughs> There's like plastic lying uh, laying around everywhere. Yes, it's not nice, but that's the earth isn't gonna die because of this. If I just throw my cigarette here, that's that that's fine. Even a little bit of plastic, it isn't gonna destroy anything. But if you just think on the, like those huge, huge like structural levels, this is happening. Like, and I think those need need to be tackled uh, if we are trying to talk about uh, climate change in any way. So I think it really needs to go further, and it needs to tackle this societal structure that holds this planet together. Can I... Mm, oh, okay. No, 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 no. Okay. no, about the fact that I uh, a little bit disagree with, with what you're saying because um, to mention the example of cleaning the beaches, maybe uh, it can uh, pave the way, it can have a sort of positive domino effect that maybe uh, the guys that are cleaning today the, the beaches tomorrow will become the, the factory chief that will introduce measures, environmentally friendly measures. So it is important also to uh, to to believe in this, maybe it's more. Diff I mean, uh, it's more a long-term vision uh, to a, a change that uh, will happen in many generations ahead of us. But what incentive would the owner of a factory have to like care about the environment? Oh, okay. Why we are using like single-use plastics and, and, and those things, and I think that those are like the things that need to be tackled in the end, in my opinion. Uh, well, I honestly don't have a personal position, but I just want to lay down things that go to my head about this topic. Um, in no way I, we, I, I don't wish to discredit the, the, responsi the, the, individual responsi the, the individual responsibility that comes with, with organizing ourselves and being very political creatures. And I think that's also a very interesting approach. But I do also have this feeling that climate change is a problem of a very different nature. It is very different from the political problems that we have been approaching so far since there's written records about it. Because climate change, especially climate change as a product of this globalized age, doesn't mean it's not a problem that can be localized. It's a problem that is not only worldwide, but the players that have influence into it are not evenly distributed. And let me put a very clear example. Um, if a factory is built in Bali by German engineers, <laughs> A factory built in Bali by German engineers that's going to be polluting Bali, that's going also to be creating a soil that's polluted by chemicals, is that one. Should we held accountable the people who live in that territory? I do truly believe that to solve this issue, devolving responsibilities and devolving competences to local authorities is not the way to go. Because a globalized problem requires a globalized solution. Yeah, I agree with you. And I, the other thing I wanted to say that I think it's a problem that still when we talk about climate change our whole usually the discussion revolves around productivity and a lot of economists admit that the GDP is not the most important factor, it doesn't show the quality of life in a certain country and then I guess we really need to change the, the priorities that we talk about and maybe GDP and productivity shouldn't be in the middle of the 
discussion it, it shouldn't revolve around that, but maybe more about how uh, like um, healthy food. Like I think, like if I'm not mistaken, food, food production is one of the main causes of or one of the biggest factors of pollution. <laughs> And our food and trust is all about being as productive as possible and being also as profitable as possible and, and very sufficient. But then where is the health? What, is, what about our health? And the whole food industry is, is also like it's really related to fossil fuel. Well, on the food industry, I think it's a very interesting case uh, because, indeed, in the food industry, uh, not a solution, but another way to deal with it that wouldn't be as polluting or almost not polluting would be very localized food industries and would be very localized uh, community groups that produce their own food. And people that produce their own food are very, are, I would say, the most aware of how the earth benefits from, from agriculture. And I think here, uh, a very localized and a very, well, yeah, this kind of communal, communal approach would be very interesting. But we have to take into account that this is not a problem that we're going to solve just changing how we do things, but we have to change the problems we have already done. And this is where I think the problem lies, because this, the, the Earth is already contagious. It's what? Infected, like, yeah, infected. Affected. Mm -hmm. Has already been infected by our pollution in the past that we cannot simply solve, solve by taking non-polluting approaches. So, yeah, whatever. The problem is not the problem, but your attitude towards the problem. Okay. But um, like, um, there's a there's a lot of industries, of course, uh, like producing uh, these pollution that we face and all that. Yeah. Plastic industry, food industry, uh, clothing industry, like for example, cotton is also one of the big problems. Uh, to, to, like before, cotton uh, was war, uh, war, uh, worn. We used uh, hemp or, or uh, wool. Uh, and hemp is actually an extract from, from cannabis and like uh, you need three months of, um, of growing before you can harvest the, the, the plant and you need very little water and for example compared to cotton we need 2,000 liters of water just for one square meter of cotton and so like it's, it's, it's actually crazy to do, to do this but the reason why we use cotton and it's connected to slavery and it's connected to uh, again like this attitude that we have is uh, yeah if, if you make for example cannabis illegal then the little farmer cannot make his hemp which was very easy and so the little farmer is forced to participate in an industry which is the cotton industry uh, which only big companies can make because of the amount of water and the amount of territory you need for in order to make yeah mass uh, make mass mass production of uh, cotton and so the point of, of the story again is like what I tried to say in the beginning is um, is, is this, this tale we tell our children uh, like it's, it's how we, we allow the, the, the story we allow to be told this is what's going to define everything and like as long as we don't dare changing the narrative of our world the narrative of, of how we yeah, educate everybody and, and the narrative of how we interact with each other and especially where are we going to because a lot of people don't, don't, don't you might be asking everybody asks questions but, but like to truly invest yourself and, and this is the power of philosophy like I, I study philosophy and like it's really beautiful to to experience these basic questions which which everybody has but rarely finds an answer to is that there are ways of thinking which do solve it and like to I don't want to be the uh, marketeer of stoicism but like stoicism is, is in my opinion one of the most beautiful ways of thinking it's like it's, it's for me it's parallel with Buddhism 
or, or Taoism in the sense that these, these philosophies, these ways of living your life, they really like address the, the issue of, of um, yeah, the greater whole and that's the whole point of it. It's like what is your position in, within this greater whole and as long as we don't think about these we don't we won't really go anywhere and, and we, we might solve one problem but we just give it a different coat and that's the problem we face is that the problem is never changed it just is given different clothes all the time and this time it's wearing uh, a, a jacket made out of fuel and the like uh, 3,500 years ago was wearing a jacket out of bronze and that's what made the Bronze Age civilization collapse uh, and there's each time this this one yeah this, this, we, we think the problem is the clothes we're wearing but no there's this structural problem which we fail to address and yeah it, it, it come, it's, it's for me it's like a, how do you say it? A direct consequence of the lack of education because we we try to address the problem from a biased point of view each time. We, we forget that the other one also has an input, and everybody in this conversation, me included, comes here saying, "Oh, I know what the problem with climate change is," but actually nobody knows in the sense that you you might have an idea of it, but it, it's it's always limited to your yeah being in the sense that. Um, Alone, you will get nowhere in life. You always need somebody else to do it together with you. And um, we need people to collaborate together to, to come up with solutions. We have to keep talking to make sure that the problem we're addressing is approached from an as unbiased way as possible. In the sense that it, we will forever be biased, we will forever be human, we will forever be addressing every problem from a human point of view. But what we can do is to actually try to relativize as much as possible and only then we can solve the true problem that we're facing. Otherwise we'll just be giving, again, different clothes to the same problem of every generation. Okay, guys. I'm very happy and very inspired by the uh, discussion. I think that we're talking for more than one and a half hours now. So I want to try to round up the discussion. Uh, I would like to make one final round for like final thoughts. If you want to get like a little bit more input, you don't have to, of course. Uh, yeah, let's move on. I think it's a link and point, like, just outline now, like, this problem of, like, scientific thinking, that it sounds really nice here, but don't really take into effect, like, how this affects other people, maybe in other, like, situations in their life, or, like, in other continents, um, and those, yeah, it's all really relative, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> in the end, it's... <laughs> <laughs> I think it's just interesting how discussing how far discussing climate change takes you. Like we we did, we, we began with climate change and we discussed philosophy and energy. And I thought that was really fun. Yeah, if I hadn't gone to class, I would ask if I could join your bus. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I was noticing that we were uh, more biased in climate, and I was thinking about uh, some recent uh, criticism that we were uh, by some. Anyway, so, uh, by some people uh, in the climate, and uh, people were arguing that going there uh, with a mountain bike doesn't make any difference. So I uh, like to ask you. About. For my position, uh, uh, I don't know if it's coming to anyway, all of those people were in the streets, so they could say, uh, no, you just need to have your opinion on this kind of activism. Can you repeat this? I would say that, uh, for example, I, uh, I saw the motorbikes, and so I was asking myself, what do you think uh, about the fact that um, people go, went to, uh, to this ride for climate change, uh, using, I mean, uh, going by bikes and using the motorbikes? What do you think about uh, this kind of activism? I think it's positive anyway. So. And we don't have a big answer at this point. Uh, and we are still 
uh, being held by the answers we gave to it in the past. So we don't really... Yeah, of course. Not. Then you will always have the, the people who go to a feminist march and then treat women like they're stupid. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, just, I would say, until we have a change in mind. And I'm very happy to see that the people of Europe, we come here and sit together and try to talk these things out. But until we don't have something to hold on to, I believe that we are trapped by the ways we think it's also toxic. Thank you very much.